Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof Chen. Uh, thank you, uh, Titiya, Prof Sutipan, and of course, the ASEAN Studies uh, Center for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and of course, uh, very le relevant uh, conference. Uh, no, no worries, I'm actually uh, still in Singapore because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, my Fulbright uh, stint in Washington DC has been uh, uh, postponed, but, but I'll, I'll try to make my way there. Uh, you know, uh, once uh, everything is in order, right? Uh, today, I'm going to briefly uh, discuss about uh, how do the Chinese uh, look at the Indo-Pacific concept and what are some of the possible Chinese responses and the implications uh, for our region, right? I'll, I'll start off first uh, by saying that, of course, uh, by stating the obvious, uh, which is there have been, uh, of course, growing attention and increasing usage of the term Indo-Pacific uh, to describe the political uh, geography of the, the uh, what was uh, commonly known as the Asia-Pacific region, right? Uh, the idea itself is, is not new, right? And there are uh, differing visions and variations of, of what exactly is the geography of Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, the previous uh, presenter, David, uh, gave an excellent presentation where he, he showed the uh, various uh, variations and uh, indeed, he also rightly pointed out uh, that, uh, you know, although uh, the, the origins of the concept itself uh, has been uh, you know, attributed to the various personalities, for example, it has been, uh, you know, uh, Kuprit uh, Kurana of India has uh, commonly cited as pioneering the, the concept. Uh, and Japanese scholars are also want to refer to Abe's 207 speech to the Indian parliament, but it's in fact, there have been earlier antecedents. Uh, indeed, in the 1920s, uh, uh, Carl Ernst Hosfer wrote of the Indo-Pacific area in his treatise, Geopolitics of the Pacific Ocean. And indeed, uh, even in the 1960s, uh, academic seminars uh, were being held in Australia to discuss security issues in the name of the Indo-Pacific region, right? This, the, the, this multi-nation origins of the concept aside, that is American employment of the term uh, that has garnered most of the attention of the Chinese scholarly and policy community. Uh, indeed, according to the China National Knowledge Infrastructure Database, which is a database that, uh, that uh, contains most uh, Chinese strategic writings and documents, it's, it's all open source. Right, uh, Chinese writings that, that specifically look into the subject of the Indo-Pacific uh, emerge uh, actually sometime from around the early 2010s, right? Uh, and indeed, one of those earlier writings, uh, the prominent Chinese scholar uh, Jin Tanong explicitly referred uh, to the speeches of then US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and the 2012 US Defense Strategic Guidance as underscoring Washington's strong promotion of the Indo-Pacific concept. So it's not just, uh, you know, going back to the 2017 uh, uh, when the then Trump administration, uh, you know, strongly promoted the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. And of course, today it has become an entrenched uh, part of US uh, regional strategy. And of course, an entrenched part of US rhetoric uh, towards the region, right? Uh, moving on to, to Chinese perceptions, uh, I would say that the dominant sentiments uh, as evidence in uh, Chinese official and uh, Chinese analytical writings on the Indo-Pacific, and indeed they, they call the term itself in, in Chinese uh, is uh, in Tai Zanle, which loosely translated is Indo-Pacific strategy, right? So the, the, the way the term is being translated itself has a, it, it, it's very clear that the Chinese see uh, as a strategy and that they, they assign strategic connotations to it, right? So the dominant sentiment uh, has been a mixture of concern and skepticism, right? Uh, in, uh, you know, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi, uh, you know, initially when the Indo-Pacific concept came out, he, uh, he brushed it off essentially, you know, he, he famously described this, the Indo-Pacific concept as sea foam, you know, as a, he, he call it a sea foam that comes and go, right? Uh, today, uh, in fact, not uh, in fact, last year he, you know, his tone changed, right? Uh, and you know, he, you know, he described it as 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 basically a U.S.-led containment strategy, 
uh, against uh, the Chinese. Right, so uh, for a lot of Chinese scholars and policymakers, you know, that's the concern, but they basically see it as part of America's uh, strategic efforts to 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 base uh, to repel and check China's regional influence, but not only to do it alone, but to bring in other uh, regional states, right? And this is further compounded by a long-standing Chinese suspicion uh, that America's strategic culture predisposes the country to identify a rival to deal with, and that and to and that today that rival happens to be a rising China, right? Uh, and in the Chinese perspective, the main threat elements in the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, are principally the strategic coordination among the US, Japan, Australia, and India, and the potential for this so-called quad, or you know, even uh, worse from the Chinese perspective, quad plus bringing in other countries, including those from Europe, uh, to develop more, uh, in their view, threatening military arrangements uh, that would diminish China's periphery and maritime security, right? Uh, for example, uh, Chinese writings, they describe Japan and Australia uh, as the north and south flanks that aid the US strategic encirclement of China. Uh, India has been identified as the crux of the Indo-Pacific strategy in the Chinese view, uh, given its traditional hegemony over the Indian Ocean region. And here, and again here, this is a matter of, it's something still a matter of debate among Chinese strategic circles. Some Chinese analysts have counseled for the proper management of the Sino-Indian relationship as the key to weakening or eliminating the Indo-Pacific strategy's negative effects, right? So in terms of more specific fears, right, there are concerns that the Indo-Pacific strategy driven by the US and pursued under the rubric or rules-based order could intensify one, intensify the security competition in Asia's maritime theaters, in particular the South China Sea, and, and two, bring about unwelcome complications for China's Belt Road Initiative, right? That's the concern part. And of course, there is also a considerable degree of skepticism over the viability and prospects of the strategy, right? Uh, some Chinese analysts, they point out that internal and external contradictions inhibit the capacity of the court to develop into a full-blown military alliance, right? And this is uh, an assessment that is based on trends that were pre-2020. So these are slightly earlier writings. So uh, I'll be interested to, to track some of those writings that watch uh, some of the new developments re uh, relating to the court and what the Biden administration is trying to do. So I suspect some of the assessments may change, but the existing assessments point to the contradictions uh, about the capacity of the court to develop into a full-blown military alliance. They point in particular to India's traditional posture of non-alignment uh, and preferred credentials as an independent pole in global politics. And they believe that in spite of uh, the growing US-India convergence, uh, uh, New Delhi will still remain cautious of becoming a perceived pawn in US strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Of course, those writings, they conveniently do not discuss about the, the uh, you know, worsening uh, Sino-Indian border dispute, right? So that part, they, they just neglect and they, you know, seems to have some sense of optimism uh, about uh, India, uh, India's overall strategic approach vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, China. And there are also some writings uh, that argue that because of China's strong trading relations in particular to Japan, and they believe that Japan uh, would still in the overall scheme of picture, uh, uh, although Japan retains uh, a strong suspicion over Chinese intentions, they would, you know, it is hoped at least that the Japanese would uh, remain pragmatic and try to keep relations on an even keel, which is to say that it would, although it would join a court, but it would not uh, you know, overly commit to some of America's uh, you know, initiatives, in particular military initiatives uh, to contain uh, China, right? Uh, of course, there are also some uh, you know, more nuanced narratives, uh, some slightly more nuanced narratives uh, that try to argue that China has always been an Indo-Pacific country and that uh, there are some complementarities that exist between the Indo-Pacific strategy and the Belt Road Initiative as both frameworks 
span overlapping uh, geographical areas. So for some Chinese scholars, they, they argue the litmus test is whether or not the Indo-Pacific framework becomes something that welcomes or excludes China. So they will argue that, you know, if China can welcome the US to join the BRI, why can't the US invite China to join its Indo-Pacific initiative that to prove that the latter isn't a counterweight to the former? So there are those kinds of uh, arguments being made. Very briefly, I understand that uh, I'm, I probably left around uh, two to three minutes. So I'm going to briefly cover what I think are possible Chinese responses. So I'll say that uh, there will be, uh, I, would, uh, I would categorize them into three responses. One would be that uh, I think China would double down on its regional economic uh, statecraft strategy, which is essentially the BRI. So Chinese uh, narratives, they argue that, no, so, so what if the, the US has the port, right? We have our BRI and, and indeed uh, the Biden administration, they have announced the economic prong of the court uh, in a way, uh, which is uh, known as what they call the B3W, uh, build, uh, build, uh, build Back Better World, right? Uh, which is basically a US-led infrastructure plan. Right. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, how the Chinese will take to this, but I, I detect they are not overly concerned uh, about the US-led uh, economic and infrastructure strategy so far. Right. Uh, and then there is, a, you know, much has been made about Xi Jinping's recent speech where, you know, he urges China to make friends. And uh, some analysts have been uh, wondering whether or not this might uh, portend a shift from China's uh, assertive diplomatic approach. Well, if you look at that phrase, uh, the thing that uh, Xi Jinping says is that, you know, China should make friends with countries that are friendly to China, right? So make friends with, you know, make friends with China, uh, countries that are already being friend, friendly to China. So it basically means that China should work on those uh, regional states, uh, in particular, those states that are already on the fence, uh, on the sidelines, to try to draw them closer to the Chinese orbit, or at least try to ensure that they remain neutral and prevent them from uh, joining the US-led uh, court-centric uh, order. And the last aspect would be something what I call an, uh, the, the, the strategy of hardening the heart. Uh, I've written about this in, uh, elsewhere, which is basically uh, the Chinese approach to defend what they think is a US-led strategic encirclement of their interests and, and to deter uh, what they believe to be the undermining of their core interests. And core interest here is, is very wide and it's expanding and it typically refers uh, thus far to Chinese territory interests that are also expanding and can range from uh, the Xinjiang issue, the Tibet issue, and of course, the number one core interest in the Chinese perspective is the, the Taiwan issue, right? Okay, I think I've, I, I may have uh, over exceeded my time and I'll just uh, end my presentation at this point so that I'll leave more time uh, for discussion during the Q&A, right? Uh, thank you very much.